Well, hello, you bearded bastards, and welcome to Delve. Usually I play Dwarf Fortress on my channel, but yeah, switching it up today. Now then, Delve. It's a solo map drawing game based around an underground dwarven citadel. Pen and paper sort of stuff, you know? It was created by Anna Blackwell, and it can be picked up at itch.io as a, you know, digital download, or you can get a copy of the rules in the mail, which is what I did. Now, cards on the table here. I am, like, incredibly unfamiliar with this game. I played it one time, didn't finish the game. I got through, like, six turns, but I could really see the potential. I think it's right up my alley, and I figured I'd just make a video on it just to, I don't know, help try to engage my imagination a little bit more. I think it's going to be really fun. That being said, totally unsure on the rules, so if you've played Delve and I'm doing something wrong, um, write it down in the comments below, I'd appreciate it. But for now, we're just gonna try to figure this thing out together. And I should also say too that this isn't like a tutorial or anything like that. I'll be talking about some of the rules, but like not going seriously in depth with it. Just gonna be having fun today. Now then, let's see, we're gonna need a pencil and eraser. Okay, grid paper, I've got graph paper here, but like, you know, we could just kind of make some bigger squares on that. You'll see what I'm talking about. Need notepad a deck of standard playing cards, and a bunch of tokens. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think we can manage that easy enough. And now the very first thing we have to do is on our grid sheet here, we're gonna have to draw the entrance to our Dwarven Citadel. In a way, this is the most important part of the Citadel, because, well, A, it's where we start, and B, if monsters or stuff get to this place here and escape our Citadel, that means we lose. And there we go, just nothing too fancy. Oh, you know, maybe we should go and like, you know, we can like fill in this area out here with some, uh, some sort of a stony texture or something like that. How does that sound? Really get that feel like we're digging through this stone. Okay, there we go. And I'm starting to already feel like we're in the Dwarven Fortress, frankly. You just picture it now, the dwarves embarking on their quest. A quest, it says here in the instruction booklet, to find the Void Crystal. Now, I'm not too sure what this Void Crystal does. It doesn't really tell you, it just says we're searching for the thing, but I mean, could be a whole slew of reasons, I suppose. And you know, that being said, another idea I had to kind of implement here alongside Delve is to include some other tables. Now, these ones aren't ones that are included in Delve, but the instruction booklet really tries to encourage you to do your own thing. Just have fun with it, you know? And so I figured, what the hell? Now then, let's see. In order to figure out why we need a Void Crystal, maybe we should figure out who our dwarves are first. And so I'm going to head over to randomfantasynamegenerators.com, a place I'd highly suggest checking out if you need some random fantasy names. And I'm going to head over to the Country Description Generator, and here we go. Our people are the Dwarves of Etrian, which is a country built on the leadership, famines, and industrial advancements of its past. This country is now among the luckiest countries in its corner of the world. Their export, clean water, and natural resources are among its current greatest strengths. Unfortunately, they lack a little in science and income. Maybe we're lucky because the uh, the natural environment out here is pretty non-hostile. We're not as advanced as others, but we don't have to be. Etrian is a socialist country. There are a couple of opposing groups against the current leadership, and this has been so for quite some time. However, the current greatest threat to the nation is air pollution. But the current leadership does whatever it takes to solve this issue. Air pollution? That seems odd in a fantasy setting. I mean, well, I suppose they're dwarves, right? They live underground, um, for the most part. Maybe they have a lot of coal in their area, and they just burn a lot of coal. Makes things a bit smoggy. It's a nice natural environment, but it's kind of being, uh, a little mucked up by all the coal smog. I can see that for sure. The dwarves of Etrian are gratified. They live wonderful lives, and while science might be lacking, their export helps relieve most of their issues. Religion holds barely any importance in their lives, and if anything, has made them more reserved. The dwarves of Etrian are extremely spiritual, however, and they have intriguing rites of passage and special rituals. Oh, that's fantastic. Hopefully we get to take a look more at that later, but at least now we have an idea of who these people are. Oh, you know, I've, uh, I've been showing a flag on the screen too. Another randomly generated bit there from chaoticshiny.com. The flag is a gonfalon with a solid gray-brown background and a diagonal bar of deep green from right to left. The emblem is a willow tree and a tree branch. Interesting, interesting. Now, notice I didn't really include a tree branch on there. I uh, kind of got carried away with the whole willow tree design. And I figured that's fine. Probably won't be sticking 100% to some of these random descriptions, especially if the mood strikes me, you know? Anyways, yes, so that's our people. And as for that void crystal, maybe it has something to do with the air pollution we were talking about. Maybe they require a void crystal in order to help clean or process the air in some fashion. Very interesting concept. Yes, I like that a lot. Oh, and you know what? I suppose we should come up with a name for our fortress, too. This place has to have a name, right? Okay, well, I rolled up some random dwarf names here, and the first last name that I liked was Silverstone. So this here is Fortress Silverstone, named for its leader. 
That's right, we should come up with characters too, I think. And the first one we're going to come up with is right here, Gilligrid, Silverstone. A description that once again came from randomfantasynamegenerators.com. And a good one, too. She has ginger straight hair tied in a bun. It reveals a lean, friendly face, narrow amber eyes. She has some sort of a mark on her cheek that stretches from her nose to the bottom of her right cheekbone. It leaves an amusing memory of forbidden adventures. There's something odd about her. Perhaps it's her patience, or perhaps it's simply her decency. But nonetheless, people tend to ask her for favors while spreading stories about her. Interesting. Well, I guess that's who's leading this place. Who could say why exactly she's been sent here? I mean, well, I mean, we know it's because of the Void Crystal, but like, you know what, just for the hell of it, not gonna use a random generator. We'll say she was tasked by the, uh, the leader of the nation, the socialist nation. Maybe not quite a king then, uh, some sort of a hegemon of some variety, uh, a figure with great political power and influence over the country of Etrian. And we'll go with the venerable Gargak Mary Mace, Master of the Mountains. A very powerful figure. He's got a number of armies under his control, I'd figure. And yet he's also well liked by the populace. Yes, maybe he's tasking Gilligrid here with going out and finding a Void Crystal in order to help her country dwarves, and so that maybe one day she too could be registered in the illustrious murals in the mountains. She could be a legendary figure just like any of these other dwarves in here. Like Thrak Grabera Redspine, Slayer of Worms. That would be something. Certainly an incentive. You get to help your people. You get to be forever immortalized. I mean, it's a win-win, really, when you get down to it. For duty and glory, Gilligrid has set out here to create her own fortress mine to search for the Void Crystal. Yes, that'll work out just fine. Hey, how about we continue and <laughs> continue digging? I got a little carried away there, but it's fun. You know, I like to get to know the people we're playing as. I like to get in the mind, a little single-player role-playing. I've always liked games like this. Anyways, okay, don't ramble. Let's continue on. What do you say? Now then, oh, something I didn't mention. I'm already going to start skipping over some rules here. But, like, when you start out playing, you have two types of resources, okay? You got, well, your resources. These are the ones used mostly to uh, construct buildings and whatnot. They're utility items, that sort of stuff. And then you got your trade goods. These are treasures and that sort of stuff, I would imagine. Stuff that holds a large monetary value, but not necessarily a utility value. We start out with 20 of both of those, okay? Oh, and also something else we gotta do is remove the jokers from our deck of cards. Kinda of set those aside for now. You add them in later on when you start digging really far down, but we won't need them now. And, uh, oh yes, yeah, gonna shuffle the deck too. Do, 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 real quick. There we go, and now then, we could take our first turn. <laughs> we still haven't even really taken a turn yet. And how we go about this is choosing a space in which we want to dig from one of our pre-existing rooms, our entrance. And I'm going to say we dig right. And to figure out what we discover, what might be buried in the earth, we have to draw a card. And so we have our shuffled deck here. Let's see what we get. And it's the Jack of Diamonds. Okay, now diamonds represent trade goods. And so when you draw a diamond card, you add its value plus the level that you're on currently to your total trade goods, so 11. We get 11 trade goods and the spot we dug into is now opened up. It's just an empty cavity right now. And in that cavity, we could build a room if we want. So you start your turn by digging and then you could decide what rooms you want to build. And now there's a whole slew of rooms. I'm not gonna go over them all right now, of course, but something I feel would benefit us is a storehouse, which is a pretty straightforward little room. After this is built, rooms on this floor cost half resources to build, while the storehouse itself costs 15 resources to make. So, yes, easy enough. We'll do that right here. Dwarves of all walks of life move in and out of the storehouse, carrying goods to where they need to be. The space is rich with the smell of wood, metal, and spices, and a small army of fortress felines safeguard against any rat or moth that dare wanders in. There is no shortage to what one can find in there. Everything from pickaxes mounted on the wall to bolts of berry dyed fabric waiting to be stitched into new garments. And there we go, wonderful. Nice place to store our resources, sort them out, get them to where they have to be. Again, this is the first time I'm playing the game, so I don't know a lot of the meta or anything like that, but I assume this is a very important building. It just seems like it'd be very helpful. Anyways, that's the storehouse, and I believe we should move on now. Okay, round two, and I think we'll dig right from the storehouse. Let's just keep it rolling that way. And so we have to draw once more. Ah yes, a three of diamonds. Three more trade goods, plus one because of our depth. 
And that there brings us up to 35 trade goods and we're down to five resources now. That's okay though, because another thing we could do is trade. After you're done moving, you could trade some of your items and there's kind of an unequal conversion rate. One trade good is worth two resources. Likewise, we could trade two resources for one trade good. So we're gonna sacrifice four trade items for eight resources, and that gives us 31 trade goods and 13 resources. And once again, we have a big empty spot over here to the right of our storehouse, a spot in which we could build something. And so now I was looking over these rooms here and I'm thinking a barracks would go nicely, like just judging on the fact that we can, we could ultimately draw any old weird card and like have a monster come out and start attacking us this very instant it might be good to protect ourselves right i would think so i would think so and that being the case okay barracks they go for eight resources but we're gonna cut that in half because of our storehouse so four resources and so let's get that underway here in the barracks a ceaseless observer gazes upon the training soldiers stone eyes marking their progress in a large cavernous room the scent of sweat Metal and armor polish mingles with the torch smoke, yet this has done little to prevent civilians from stopping by to observe drills and mock battles. Aspiring young dwarves hoping to gain a position in the military dash back and forth with water and rations, hoping to one day join in the ranks of the fortress guard. And there we have it. Wonderful. Okay, it's all carved out. It's all in place now. And as for its utility, a barracks can be used to recruit soldiers. I'm sure you guessed as much. And it can be used to recruit either like warriors or gunners, melee or ranged fighters. And when you recruit them, they kind of just sit in this room until combat begins, from what I understand. Now, we're not going to do that quite yet, but um, uh, maybe next turn, I guess. I'm feeling confident this next card won't ruin our entire fortress here. Let's just see. Let's move on to round three. And this time, I want to dig left from our entrance, okay? We're going to go back over this way. And we're going to draw a card. <laughs> oh, the three of spades. Okay. Now, that there is a remnant. Diamonds, like we've been drawing, are trade goods. But spades are remnants, which are just dangerous. But you ignore spades up on the top row here. This is like the safe zone of the fortress, kind of a, a place to get you started. And so you ignore spades up here. We're just going to draw again. Let's see what we get. An ace of diamonds, okay. That's a little better. Two more trade items. Not a lot, but we'll take it. Now again, we still have a lot of trade items here, so we're gonna trade some off, six of them, for 12 resources. And in this new chamber here, I wanna construct a shrine of fortune. And it costs 20 resources to build, but this is halved because of our storehouse. Really not that bad when you get down to it. And now let's see here. The dwarves of Etrian believe there is one force in this world far more powerful than any god that force being fortune. The coins of the shrine gleam with the ever-present flame of the sconces above. These otherwise useless disks of metal are used to feed the poor, elevate position, and turn impossibilities into things quite possible. The riches of Silverstone pour forth from the sacred chamber. And there we go, just like that, done deal. Now, what this building here does is that from this point forward, anytime we draw a diamond card, it's worth plus three trade items. And seeing as how we've drawn three diamond cards already, I'd say that bodes well for our future prospect. Another thing to know is that shrines can hold a single cleric, and the cleric has to be present in order to activate the shrine's effects. So we might as well hire a cleric now. They're kind of expensive, they cost eight trade items, but well, it's gonna be worth it, I'm, I'm sure. We'll do that, okay. Here is our cleric, and they're just gonna sit in this chamber right here. Now that unit there can be used to fight, kind of, they're not really fighters, Clerics are more used to like shield your units or something. Still a little foggy about that whole system, but we'll figure it out in time. I'm not too worried about it. That being said, I think we could use a unit to actually fight for us too. Clerics aren't strong at all. And so yes, we're finally gonna build a soldier over here in our barracks that costs five more trade items. So just like that, we're down 13 trade items, but that's fine because now we have a cleric and a soldier. A soldier has five strength and a cleric only has one. Something to note there. I believe they can kind of like move towards each other and combine their power if combat begins. I don't know, again, we'll look into it at some point. Whenever we find combat, I suppose. <laughs> now then, moving on to round four. And you know what? I'm gonna dig right of the barracks one more time. We had some pretty good luck this way. I figure if we dig over here when we do encounter some sort of a monster, it'll have to pass through the barracks, right? So yeah, that'd probably be pretty smart of us. Now let's see what we get. Oh, it's a four of clubs. What is a club? Oh dear. The eastern wall of the barracks had always been sort of 
damp. It was an annoyance for sure, but not an emergency. That is until the miners began their task. Before they could know what happened, a river swept through a chunk of the fortress like some terrible serpent, throwing citizens and equipment alike against the stone walls with tremendous force. There was nothing they could do against such an occurrence. This would serve as an early loss for the dwarves of Silverstone, as well as a reminder of the dangers that could be encountered underground. Okay, so, clubs are natural formations, and a four of clubs is an underground river. So when you dig out into this space here, you find the river. You draw the river all the way to the closest page edge, and the place where you dug into serves as like the source of water, okay? Now, liquids in here, they move out from their source to spaces. And if they encounter a way to go downwards, they flow all the way down. Just trying to wrap my mind around the whole process here. So I think all that happens here is the water comes out two spaces, ruining our barracks and our storehouse, and killing the units within, so our one soldier that we just recruited died. That's a damn shame. And now these two rooms are filled with water. Substellar. I am... Now just skimming through the rule book here, rooms can be damaged. But I don't think these rooms are damaged. It's not something you have to repair, though they are filled with water. And I would assume you have to pump the water out in order to use them again. Makes sense to me. Yeah, okay, it says rooms filled by liquid or gas can be drained at a cost of five trade items. Really? Okay. So I suppose we should do that. Um, five trade items to pump the water out of the storeroom, just like that. And then five more trade items to pump the water out of the barracks. Now, again, I'm pretty new to the game, but I believe this whole river section here, all of these tiles count as empty chambers that are filled with water. And so if I wanted to, I could continue spending trade goods and pump the water out of each of those tiles as well, and then build rooms in them, which would be pretty neat. Not going to do it, but something to note. Man, oh man, our items are looking pretty bad right now. We're down to four trade items and 11 resources. Hoping for some good news coming up. Speaking of which, how about we continue on? What do you say? Now, okay, we have the river over to the right. Gonna want to stay up here on the top level for now, I'm thinking. And so with that in mind, our only option is left of the Shrine of Fortune. Let's get to digging dwarves, and let's see what we have here. It's a three of diamonds. Hey, all right. That's a three, plus one for the depth, and plus three more for the Shrine of Fortune. Seven trade items. Just what we needed. Okay, and now we have ourselves this uh, big empty chamber here, too. And I suppose we should probably build something in here. And you know what I think we need? I think Silverstone could use a nice kitchen. What do you say? The kitchens were loud today, following Borhawk Cave Belly's newest creation. Not a single soul had ever guessed braising groutons with cherry sauce would be such a crowd pleaser. Dwarves of all ages lingered on the stone staircases, watching with hungry eyes as Borhawk slowly churned away at another fragrant batch of cherry sauce. The warmth of the cook fires did little to turn them away, and the scent of the secret spices Borhawk sprinkled into the cauldron only drew in more. Now, okay, there we have it, our kitchen. Nice little place, I say. Now, a kitchen will allow units that are nearby, I guess during combat, to have plus 50% strength. All right, so, like, if you had two soldiers in a room that was adjacent to the kitchen here, that'd be 10 strength normally, but because they're next to the kitchen, it would bring them up to 15. I think that's going to be good because, well, I mean, we don't have any soldiers right now, but it'll kind of, like, amplify the power of the ones that we do have coming up. Gonna get right to that, but first, I think we have to generate up a new dwarf. I figured because we have a kitchen here, we should probably get a head chef, don't you say? And so I messed around with some generators and got this guy here. His name's Borahawk Cavebelly, head chef of Silverstone. An interesting fellow, for sure. His short golden hair hangs over a full, warm face. Big, round, pale eyes set sunken within their sockets watch eagerly over the stronghold they fought for for so long. Tribal marks in the form of two stripes under his right eye marks his upbringing, but more importantly, leaves a pleasant memory of deceased love. I like him. I like the cut of his jib. And I gotta say, adding generators into the mix is really, it's feeling good, I think. Ooh, speaking of which, I wanted to create a signature dish for this guy, but I couldn't really find any good food generators online, so I had to make up my own. Step one, I had to roll a d6 for the main portion, and I got a one meat for the meat type, another d6. Rolled a six for unidentifiable, so we have unidentifiable meat so far. The meat cooking style, another d6 there. I rolled a five for braised, and for additions, another d6, I got fruit sauce. 
you know, went with cherries just for the heck of it. So we have a braised unidentifiable meat with some sort of a fruit sauce, and that's where the braised groutons with cherry sauce came from, which I think is just a lovely little dish. Little disconcerting what the unidentifiable meat is, but I figure it could just be some like meat scrapings or something. Maybe it's just scraps like leftover stuff. A hot dog, right? <laughs> hot dog with cherry sauce. Okay, we're, I mean, I guess it doesn't sound so appealing, but the dwarves like it, that's for sure. That's all that matters. It's a Silverstone specialty. Anyways, yes. Okay, so now we have our cook. We got our groutons. We got our kitchen. Excellent. Now, yes, we should probably hire on a new warrior just so we have someone to defend our fortress besides just the single cleric. And there we go, right over there. Good luck to you, soldier. That's minus five trade items. And it's going to bring us to the end of round five right there. Okay, okay. We're starting to come back after that river fiasco. Now then, uh, yeah, round six. Let's keep it rolling to the left. Going to dig again. Let's see what we get here. An eight of hearts. Okay, that's not bad. That gives us nine resources. We'll take it. And you know what? Maybe we'll, um, yeah, what the hell? We'll get another soldier too. So now we have two soldiers sitting over in the barracks. Minus five more trade items. That's not bad though. We can spare them. And you know what? That's going to wrap up round six. So let's keep on rolling. Speed things up a little. For round seven, we're going to dig leftward once more. And now let's see what happens. Ooh, looks like we have a 10 of clubs. That's another natural formation. As the Silverstone miners broke through the thin crust of rock, a brief shift in air pressure pulled dust into billowy clouds. As the wispy haze began to settle, the dwarves peered through the aperture and into a chamber unlike anything created by dwarven hands. An ancient obsidian tube stretched far down into the dark. Where its bottom might lie was anyone's guess, though surely none wanted to be the one who found it. Okay, that's a dormant volcanic shaft, and you draw it all the way down to the bottom when you discover it. That's pretty wild, huh? That's gonna be, what, eight tiles down? That's nuts. <laughs> so be it. So we have this giant, just, tube here now, which I guess creates some problems, mentally, for me, with the rules. Because, like, could I dig from the bottom of this if I wanted? I don't think so, right? Skimming through the rules, okay, there's a, um... It looks like you can construct stairs. Like, if I wanted to, I could build stairs down through this thing. It doesn't really make sense that we could just, like, throw dwarves down over the edge and just start digging at the bottom. Well, no matter. Let's figure out what we're going to be doing here. Um, okay, that last chamber that we dug out. Still haven't done anything with that. How about we build in here an overseer's office? How's that sound? I mean, it costs 15 resources, but that's halved because of the storehouse. Just not sure whether to round up or down. So, we're going to flip a coin. Heads, we round down and heads it is now what this is gonna do here i figured we put it here because um any diamond cards that we find below this room are worth double now i figure we can probably start i guess like maybe building stairs into this um this volcanic tube over here maybe um yeah still a little unsure of how the whole thing works frankly but well i guess we're gonna be focusing downwards now and it would be useful if the diamonds down here were worth double Overseer Gilligrid's office was said to be one of the finer examples of Etrian architecture. The silken banners were never left to dust, and the candles above cast a purposeful shadow on the Overseer's station. A large stone throne sat next to an even larger stone desk, which housed Silverstone's ever so vital records of history and commerce. It served as Gilligrid's throne room, and a sumptuous place it was. The only complaint was a periodic scraping beneath the floor stones still finding their way into a settled position. Only slightly annoying. No real issue at all. Okay then, now we have our overseer's office. And I'm looking through the rule book here and it looks like stairs and corridors. That's like a little bonus building you can make. And I would have to build stairs in a couple of these tiles over here in the volcanic shaft and if we, you know, we want to go down farther, which I do. But they still count as your one building a turn that you can build. So I can't build stairs this turn. I guess we're going to be moving on to the next turn because there's not really that much else we could do. That's fine, though. Um, yeah. Round seven, done. Round eight. And since we have to dig at the start, the only place we're going to want to go is down right here under the overseer's office. And so let's get to it. Start digging, dwarves. Let's see what we got here. Oh, boy. Another club. A king of clubs. As the dwarves began to crack away at the overseer's floor, they found there to be a little resistance in the stone below. Tink, tink, tink. 
they continued on, but the stones began to shift and soon fell away, exposing a terrible sight. As the flabby slabs of greenish flesh began to roil in the slime-coated chamber below, the dwarves stood in awe. That is, until they saw the teeth their doom had come. Okay, that's not good at all. King of Clubs, that's a burrowing beast with 20 strength. It digs a tunnel straight up from this space. When it reaches one of your rooms, combat starts and it moves normally towards the entrance. Okay, so this is our first combat that we've experienced. And well, you can see the creature here. Um, there are some tables in the book that I could roll on to see what kind of monster it was. But I mean, this game tells you you can just do whatever the hell you want. So for our creature, I created a new table. For the type of creature, a D6, rolled a three and got amphibian. For its body type, another D6, I got one. For a worm-like body type, it's limbless. We have a limbless amphibian. For the head slash face, another D6. I rolled a six and got unidentifiable. So we have an amphibian that's like a worm without an identifiable head. And for its abilities, another D6, I got plated. So we have some sort of an armored amphibian without any limbs and no identifiable face or head, which, you know, you can see the creature right here. It, uh, it's, it's got a mouth. You know where its head is for the most part, but like, that's just to keep it interesting. Yeah, so this is what we're working with. This terrible, horrible creature. Um, yes, this thing just, I mean, I guess burrowed straight up into the overseer's office. Just kind of <laughs> crashed up there and now combat begins. Oh, and you know, I'm also seeing here in the instruction booklet that the triggered combat will give the enemies starting strength. But as you go deeper under the ground, they will get stronger. When spawning an enemy, add five to its strength for each level of depth. Okay, so this thing's on level two. Instead of 20, it's gonna be 30 strength on this worm. Okay, great. And how combat works is the enemy goes first and attempts to move towards the fortress entrance, which that's gonna bring it right over here into our kitchen. And so, <laughs> For our fighters, I mean, boy, there's really not that much we could do, huh? We have our two soldiers in the barracks and then our one cleric in the Shrine of Fortune. We couldn't even get our soldiers over to the kitchen if we wanted to. I guess I'll move the cleric over towards the entrance and we'll shift to the two soldiers over towards the storeroom. Move out, soldiers. The things are looking bleak. On the next turn, the worm's gonna move over towards the shrine. It's now in the Shrine of Fortune. And I'm gonna move our soldiers a little bit more towards the entrance. They're now paired up with the cleric but I don't know there's much we could do. And okay, for the next turn, we see combat between the worm of 30 strength and our poor, poor fighters over here who have a paltry 11 strength, five for each warrior and one because of the cleric. And well, they put up a good fight, but there really wasn't that much they could do, unfortunately. They were just smashed by the thing. The cleric has a shield, which adds a little bit of protection, but it was of no use whatsoever. They were absolutely obliterated and unfortunately, this worm has reached our entrance, which means Silverstone has fallen. Damn it. Well, <laughs> it goes to show you how fast a fortress can fall, huh? Gotta say, you do feel pretty helpless when you see all that stuff playing out like that. You know, just a worm kind of going down the corridors and making its way towards your warriors, which you know can't possibly fend it off. <laughs> but still. Now, something I'm gonna wanna do here is because our fortress ended and, well, the worm came up straight underneath the overseer's office, I think we should do a roll to see whether or not our overseer survived. Obviously, a lot of civilian dwarves fell that we haven't seen, but Gilligrid was in peril during that. So we're gonna flip a coin. Heads, she perished. Ah, there we have it, okay. Well, for a little context, I'm gonna flip it again to see whether it was a heroic death or an accidental death. Heads it was heroic? Ah, oh, damn. Okay, so she must have just been sitting at her desk when that worm came barreling up like that, and well, that was that. Poor Gilligrid. Looks like her story and the story of Silverstone has come to an end. The Abystomax is a rarely encountered beast that lurks under the shallow stone of Etrian's western ranges. Unfortunately for the dwarves of Silverstone, it was only very early in their quest they encountered such a beast. The fortress had failed in its quest for the Void Crystal, and the dwarves of Etrian became ever more desperate as their smog-choked skies became darker still. Though where there is hope, one will always find dwarves willing to do their part in donning the mantle of Crystal Seeker. In Etrian, every story's end marks the beginning of another, even grander, and there we 
have it. So ends our first fortress here in Delve. And I gotta say, I had a pretty darn good time too. Hopefully you could tell as much. <laughs> really inspiring. You know, ever since I was younger, I've always wanted a game that could be kind of like played as a role-playing game, but you know, solo. And that also really jogged your creativity. And Delve seems pretty perfect for that. You know, it's got those rules in place, but it also really encourages you to do your own thing too. Really, you could play it any way you want. And speaking of which, actually, uh, at the back of the book, there's this little blurb that I really liked. I'll put it in quotes. Feel free to let your imagination run wild. Make your hold as weird, wonderful, fun, or dark as you like. If you want candy golems and luchadors, go for it. See, that's inspiring right there. You know, if we wanted to bend the rules just slightly, I could say we were playing as goblins, right? And that we're like digging down underground in search of, I don't know, something other than a void crystal, right? The demon skull or something. Hell, I could say we're playing as mole people even, on their way down to find some sort of a, I don't know, the golden grub. Something ridiculous. Just a fun little game. And from what I understand, it's got a bunch of expansions to it too. I haven't really looked into it though. I'll put some links down in the description below if you wanna go check it out. I highly encourage that you do. And if you enjoyed this video, please let me know in the comments below. It's a bit different from my channel and I'm trying to figure out if I should pursue more stuff like this or maybe even continue on with Delve for a little while or just try some other games and maybe add some random generation into the mix too. Still trying to figure things out. Anyways, my bearded bastards, I really do hope you enjoyed yourselves today. Thank you for watching. If you did enjoy yourself an awful lot, well, I do have a Patreon where $1 goes a long, long way to helping me and my family create these videos. And I've also been trying to do behind the scenes pictures like daily, pretty much. Pictures and music, other stuff too. I thank you in advance, my friends. And until next time, you bearded bastards. Mm -hmm.